Library for this live presentation. My name is Nancy Cool, and I'm the program coordinator for Bruce County Public Library. For today's library talks with chat, we welcome Rob Shave, coordinator for the Butterfly Way project in Sogging Shores. The Butterfly Way project was created by the David Suzuki Foundation in 2017. From small beginnings in five cities, groups have been created in over 400 communities as of 2020. The mission of the project is to plant native wildflowers in backyards, schoolyards, streets, and parks to support bees and butterflies with a goal of establishing at least a dozen pollinator patches in each community. So today we'll learn about the group started this year in Sogging Shores and how you can either join or start one in your own community. So before we get started, we just have a few housekeeping items that we'd like to go through. While listening and watching today, we encourage you to submit any questions or comments to our web form on the Bruce County Public Library website, and you should be able to see the link on your screen here or in the comments during the presentation. We will address questions following the presentation and we welcome questions from you. You may wish to take this opportunity to grab a pen and paper to jot down any information during the presentation. And if you don't get a chance to watch live, this presentation will be recorded and posted here on the library's YouTube channel in our special guest playlist. And you will find the recording there so you can watch later and share with friends and family. And if you haven't already, remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel to keep up to date with all our live presentations. Following the presentation, we encourage you to fill in a short evaluation form. The link is in the description for the event and on our website. Your feedback and stories help show the value in what the library does in our communities. Um, so Rob, Rob is a retired engineer and he has been an amateur naturalist for many, many years. He is currently converting 10 acres of formal agricultural land to a managed forest. And among the tree seedlings he's planted during the past few years, he has observed an increasing variety of native plants and the pollinator insects that use them for food and habitat. So this sparked an interest in pollinators. He joined the David Suzuki Butterfly Way project in February this year, and he's currently enrolled in the Master Naturalist program at Lakehead University. So welcome today, Rob, and we're really looking forward to seeing your presentation and asking lots of questions and hearing all about the Butterfly Way project. Thanks very much, Nancy, and uh, welcome to everybody who's joined. Um, let's just get started. And before I would like to make a land acknowledgement uh, to the First Nations of our area. So here in Bruce, uh, I want to acknowledge the territory of the Anishinaabek Nation. It's the people of the three fires known as Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi Nations. And further give thanks to the Chippewas of the Saugeen and the Chippewas of Naywatch, known collectively as the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, as the traditional keepers of this land. So as Nancy mentioned the Butterfly Way project it is a David Suzuki Foundation sponsored project uh, but there are some other national project partners as well and you can see them on the screen. So our goal well the number one goal there's several of them but the number one goal is to have more native plants and if possible get those locally sourced. And the number two goal promote the benefits of pollinators And our number three goal is, and this is the practical part of it, uh, to try and establish 12 pollinator patches in every community. The local group um, is the Butterfly Way Saugeen Shores group. And I formed a Facebook page uh, for us. Um, I have a mailing list of people who are interested. And these are just contacts I had in the community. Back in March, uh, after I got noticed, notified by the um, David Suzuki Foundation National Butterfly Way project team that I was, I was going to be on their team this year, uh, I thought, okay, I'll go ahead and purchase some seeds. So I have a number of seeds uh, for people who are interested, different varieties, all um, appropriate to our ecoregion. And there's also a lot of information that uh, some of which I've linked to on the Facebook page, but I'll give you more of those links today. And they're all, all um, those documents are on Google Drive and it's a, uh, they're public domain. So how are we doing in Saugeen Shores for our uh, local group? Well, so far I've got um, 
a mailing list of about 60 people. And of those, seven have said, yes, I want to make a new pollinator patch. I've never done it before. What do I do next? And then others on the list say, you know, I've had a pollinator patch in the back where I have uh, pollinator friendly bushes, but I'd like to expand that. You know, what can I add to make it more interesting or to make it uh, more appealing to pollinators? So I think we're off to a pretty good start and uh, I'm hoping it will just grow from there. So there are some frequently asked questions, and I've, I'm taking some of these slides, by the way, from the material that was presented to um, myself and all the other uh, Butterfly Way volunteers across the country. The, the project team is national, as Nancy mentioned, and they do a pretty good job of keeping us um, up to date and bringing us together and helping us uh, accomplish what the, the project goals are. And these are some of the frequently asked questions that they get. So number one question, where are the Butterfly Way groups located? And here's the answer. Uh, as you can see, we're all across the country. And the different colors were previously um, in the program and also new groups that have just started this year. The second question is, where do I find information? And uh, there is something called the Ranger Toolkit, and it is the, the Google Drive that I was mentioning before. So with access to that, there is all sorts of uh, information on um, studies about pollinators. Uh, there's how-to guides, uh, how to create a, a garden in your yard, um, how to make a, a pollinator patch plan, uh, how to make a container garden. Uh, there's images of signs if you'd like to label your garden or put up a small sign just so people know that it's a pollinator patch, then the Butterfly Way team have come up with some uh, sign templates that you can download and print off and put in a plastic case um, or even bind your, the window of your uh, house just to say, yes, this is a pollinator patch. So there is a lot of information available in this Ranger toolkit. Uh, question number three, what exactly is a pollinator patch? And this is nice, but I'm not going to read this fine print right now because I do have some slides uh, later on that will address uh, exactly that question. So we'll just put that on hold for a few minutes. And the fourth question is, well, OK, I'm interested. Um, I'm thinking about it. Uh, how do I get started? Like, where do I where do I go from here? And probably the best um, is to go to that uh, Ranger Toolkit Google Drive and find the one document that is sort of the most comprehensive to start with. And it's simply called How to Make a Pollinator Garden. And it's, it's very well written. There's a lot of pictures. Um, it's comprehensive, but it's not going to put you off. It's not intimidating. And it gives a really good feel of, OK, this is this is how to do step one. Here's how to do step two. Um, I can do this. So it's a very, very good document to begin with. And that's how to make a pollinator garden. And then the last most frequently asked question is, well, what's next? And from my point of view, what's next is make that decision to create a pollinator patch on your property. And the bonus is uh, we all have lawns and we all know that um, th there's pleasing aspects to lawns, but there's also the side of lawn maintenance that takes time and effort and money. And the thing about pollinator patches is they are easier than maintaining a lawn. They're perennials. Uh, and they look nice even if they're not watered late in the summer. They look nice if you never cut them. Uh, and they're much, much more interesting to watch because they're just alive with, uh, with creatures. So there are, um, if you have a vacant lot or if you've seen any vacant lots and nobody goes in to cut the grass and it's not yet treed, within several years, a whole variety of uh, native perennials will colonize that property 
and before long you'll have a nice natural pollinator patch there. So there is a very nice one in Southampton. There are several in the community, but this is one that I like and I created a or made a short video. Uh, and we So I, I hope that uh, gives you a good picture, a good um, sense of what a pollinator patch looks like. And one of the things I'll point out um, is, and, and, and you can do this yourself, it's very easy. Uh, just notice how noisy it was. So if you stand next to a lawn, it's typically very quiet. But if you stand next to one of these pollinator gardens and it's large enough, it's, it's so alive with uh, insects and birds that it's noisy. And it's a, it's a really nice noise. I know there's a bit of traffic noise in the background of the video, but the, the main thing about uh, these pollinator patches is just how busy they are with insects and birds. A bit of background information in the next few slides uh, and answer to these other questions. Like what is a butterfly way? Um, what is a pollinator patch? Uh, where do I make one? Uh, how do I locate a source for uh, native perennial plants? Um, when should I start the, the work? And do I need to be an expert? And then the last question is why? Why is this important? I mean, why are we why are we helping our pollinators? Question is what is a butterfly way? Well, it really is a corridor of butterfly. Uh, sorry, of um, pollinator patches. Static, they move from place to place according to the weather and even the time of day. And so by creating this corridor, we're actually enabling them to be able to move to places they need to get to uh, to make their lives better. So if we can space out our uh, pollinator patches and give them places to go which don't have a long distance between them, then it's better for them. And then every uh, local butterfly way group is kind of organized by a butterfly way ranger. You know, that's my title, butterfly way ranger. Uh, but these rangers, uh, we are located all across the country. So every local group has a butterfly ranger who is, you know, the person to go to for questions and, uh, and assistance. So existing pollinator habitats in Saugeen Shores face development. And this is a, an image from the video. And uh, we live in a community that's desirable. A lot of people are coming up here and we've seen how many new houses and subdivisions are being made. And, you know, there's positives about that. But one of the things we can do if we're losing this natural habitat is on, on our properties, we can create more wildflower patches. And so that's one of our, our goals is we know that we're losing natural habitat for the pollinator. We ate some of that habitat uh, ourselves. So what exactly? It's a native plant filled habitat. And it really is a habitat. It's not just a collection of, of nice flowers that come back year after year. Uh, habitat means a food supply, which is the nectar and pollen, but it also means a source of water and shelter and uh, in some cases a host plant or a place for larvae so that the insects can reproduce. 
And then even during the winter, a pollinator patch will provide uh, overwintering protection in the dead and empty stalks of some of the plants or in the leaves or in uh, the parts of the plant flowers that fall into the ground. Insects will actually hide in there over the winter. Uh, there's no minimum or maximum size. Uh, it can be a full park. It could be a planter on your front step. And what we're aiming for is a variety of heights. Uh, and there are plants that accommodate this. There are ones low to the ground. There are ones up to two or three meters. Uh, we want a variety of colors and we want uh, different blooming seasons. So it's great if we can have pollinators that bloom as early as April, as soon as the snow's gone, and carry their blooms or come up with new blooms uh, at the end of the season. So the pollinator plants will bloom uh, for a period of time, but what we're aiming for is to have some plants that bloom early and some in the middle and some that bloom late. So that was one definition of a pollinator patch, but it, another definition is that it's just paradise. You know, it's what they need, it's what they're looking for, and it's what, what they can um, exist in and thrive. And a pollinator patch of flowers, but also shrubs. Um, if you have trees that are pollinator friendly, then create a kind of ecosystem for them. Um, for example, there's uh, one particular butterfly, is the morning cloak butterfly, and it comes out very early in the spring. I think I saw one about three or four weeks ago in that warm patch we had. And there were no blooms at all then. But this particular butterfly, the morning cloak, has adapted to feed off the sap that trickles out of trees from broken twigs or scars in the bark. And you see them and you wonder, well, why are they here? Because there's no blooms. But that's one of their adaptations. And different pollinators adapt uh, different ways. So it's not just flowers, but it's, um, it's a full ecosystem. So where can we make these patches? Uh, any new or existing garden it could be a lawn that you uh, take away some of the sod. It could be a border along a driveway. Uh, it could be a balcony or a windowsill. They can be private yards or lots. Setbacks is actually an excellent place for um, putting in pollinator patches. And I, I have a slide on that later. But our building code requires that houses are set back a minimum distances from the road and commercial properties as well. And the larger the building, the, the bigger the setback. And typically those setbacks, it's it's just a lawn. I mean, nobody sits there in a lawn chair. Kids aren't playing games there. The owners often put something there just so it's not unkempt. However, that something could just as easily be a pollinator patch. Um, on public lands, it could be parks, schools, medians, ditches, rail trails, and those efforts would be done, of course, uh, in tandem with um, staff and the approval of town council. Uh, the pollinator patch uh, should be close to water if possible. However, a lot of places don't have nearby water, so a watering bowl will do just as well as long as it's filled up every few days. And then we can identify opportunities uh, in our community where, as I mentioned, in order to create the pollinator corridor or butterfly way corridor, are there places where we need to fill gaps and, and hopefully find friends or neighbors who are willing to set up a pollinator patch in one of those gaps. So here's a couple of images of a pollinator patch. The one on the left is uh, a nice flat, normal backyard. The portion of the grass was dug up and this uh, lovely pollinator patch was put in. Now the one on the right is a is a different, different uh, micro ecosystem altogether. It's not a lawn. It's, it looks very sandy. It's probably very close to the beach and there's a slope along it. However, uh, the nice thing about pollinating plants is the native ones, they have adapted for every possible ecosystem niche in our region. And I'll get to our region pretty soon, but it's uh, there's such a large variety that virtually uh, will be amenable to some kind of pollinator friendly plant. So where do you find the plants? Uh, I put together a list. Uh, some of these were sent to me by members of our group and some I just found on the web. Um, I make this list available on our um, 
uh, Facebook page, so I'm not going to read these off, but there are providers locally for uh, native perennials. And in addition to that, as I mentioned before, I do have a large number of seeds. And as Nancy said, I do have a woodlot, and on that wood that have just come up on their own. So here we see some uh, Joe pie weed, which butterflies like quite a bit. And uh, I'm happy to provide some of those and dig them up uh, if it's early enough in the year. And they can help a new pollinator patch have that established look fairly quickly. So when do we start the work? Uh, prepping the garden, um, we actually don't want to do that too, too early. I had a nice email from one of our members that said, um, you know, we should let everyone know that just because the weather's warm, let's not go out there with rakes and uh, wheelbarrows just yet. And the reason for that is, uh, as I mentioned, the overwintering insects, they're hiding out in all of that debris in our garden, and they don't really start to emerge until the temperature is consistently above about 10 degrees, which it hasn't been the last few days. So I'm, this is a, a good reason to kind of stay indoors, not necessarily stay indoors, but to not have to get out and do work in the garden. So we don't want to start prepping the garden until we've given those pollinators a chance to to kind of get out and uh, do what they're going to do. In terms of stratifying the seeds, um, well, I've already started doing that. And uh, stratification was new to me before I joined this project, but essentially it means uh, fooling the seed into thinking that it's in a natural environment because the seeds are harvested in the fall when it's very dry and they're kept in a, a cool um, kind of climate controlled place. And then when you order them, they haven't really experienced the winter, but a lot of seeds have evolved to, to expect uh, to have to lay on the ground through the winter and experience cold and moist conditions. And only if they get that will they actually germinate. So that's called stratifying. And it, uh, one, one way to do it is to just get some sand, um, some clean sand, you dampen it, you mix the seeds in and then seal up a little baggie and put it in the fridge. Some seeds need to stratify for 30 days, some for 60, some need 120 days, some need just two or three days. So I have all this information and I have a lot of seeds that are currently in a, a nice dark cool fridge, rolled up in uh, bags of sand waiting for me to go and get them and spread them. And those are the seeds that if uh, anybody wants to uh, start a garden, it's kind of too late to distribute the dry seeds, but I'm happy to distribute the ones that have uh, completed their stratification and then they can just go straight into the ground. In terms of planting, uh, around here, um, my dad used to say he never puts anything in the ground before the middle of June, but he lived closer to the lake. So depending on where you are, and because climate's been changing, uh, I think some plants would do fine to be put in the ground uh, mid-May and others we might want to wait till mid-June. And also it depends too on how many stratifying days uh, they need. To be an expert, um, definitely not. Uh, I've learned a tremendous amount just in the last few months, um, you know, having to kind of live up to the title of butterfly ranger. And I've, I've learned it all just from the documents that are on the um, Google Drive in the Ranger Toolkit. So if you're interested in reading, uh, the information's there. You, you don't have to be an expert gardener, you don't have to be a naturalist, uh, but if you're interested, uh, you can be one. You can be a, an excellent pollinator patch gardener. One of the main uh, points in uh, trying to create a pollinator patch is, I like this phrase, floral bullseye. And from our point of view, we have very good vision and we can see um, individual flowers in a patch. But to a pollinator, it can sometimes be difficult uh, for them to find what they need. And they are attracted to specific colors. Some pollinators prefer reds, others uh, purple, some yellows. And so the idea of a floral bullseye is to create a big enough patch of color that pollinators as they're moving from patch to patch, we'll be able to see your particular patch of color and say, oh, that looks inviting because it's a nice big splotch of yellow or a nice big splotch of uh, lilac. 
So we want to create this floral bullseye, and it turns out that that's about one square meter of a particular color. But that's not a hard and fast rule, it's just a goal. And then uh, the other thing we want to try and do is create the all season buffet effect. So as I mentioned earlier, some species blooming early and some species blooming late. Uh, one of the most important parts that I stress uh, when people ask me about seeds and what plants to put in is to find out uh, what the host plants are that these pollinators need. And all that information is available. So if you're looking for plants, then whether or not it's a host plant is a pretty good criteria to help choose um, what plants to put in. OK, so the why, why are we doing this? And for me, it's well, for all of us, we like to eat. There's a, a surprising number of um, foods that we eat as Canadians that would be very difficult for us to obtain if it were not for native pollinators. I mean, we're part of the food chain and they're the fundamental part. They're right at the bottom of the food chain. Without them, we're not getting uh, plants producing seeds and nuts and fruits, everything from apples to tomatoes. So that's why we need them. And they're under threat, you know, we all know about climate change and we've got lots of urban development and we know agriculture changes the land. But even things like light pollution, light pollution can be extremely disorienting to pollinators. Uh, introduced species, uh, water drainage, I mean, a lot of building codes, and it's true for us too, are increasing uh, the efforts they put into draining water because we're all concerned about, um, you know, increasing uh, severity of thunderstorms and things like that. However, that's that's not how nature expects things to happen. Nature actually prefers to have standing water and pollinators have evolved over time to be able to go to these uh, easy, ac easily accessible uh, ponds and um, little pools that remain after rainfall and little creeks and streams. And where we have developed urban areas and even agricultural areas, we tend to think, you know, we can use the land better if we drain it, if we get the water away from there. But what we want to do actually for pollinators is create places for them to access water. And then, of course, things like road traffic. Um, a lot of pollinators are taken out by windshields every year. And then there's pesticides, insecticides and herbicides. So, yeah, there are all those threats are there. And what we're trying to do with the Butterfly Way project is create habitats to allow the pollinators to thrive despite those threats. So there's a really good um, presentation on the Google Drive. It's called Where Have All the Insects Gone by Linda Gilken Gilkison. And I just want to show uh, two or three slides, three slides from her presentation. Right, the value of pollinators. So 85% of plants need those pollinators to reproduce. And then a third of all our human food plants, so for Canada that's greater than 100 food crops, need pollinators. And then 24% of all birds and mammals uh, have fruit and seeds as a major part of their diet. So this really points out just how essential these pollinators are to our entire e ecosystem, to our entire food chain. And what we can do about them, or what we can do to help create these, you know, beautiful pollinator patches. I call them beautiful because they're just they're just so striking. They're so diverse. Uh, they're kind of wild. It's it's not uh, it's not a managed garden like a lot of us think of gardens. Pollinator patches, uh, in some, some ways, are more like a traditional English garden, uh, which English gardens can be kind of wild too. And so by creating these, we can help them out. I've gone over this, but I'll, I'll say it again. They need uh, pollen and nectar. That's their food. They need host plants for the larva. Uh, they need shelter, so a safe environment with no pesticides, night lighting, no bug zappers. They need water, especially in, uh, around here. It would be July and August. And they need nesting sites and places to overwinter. To get started uh, with making a pollinator patch, we would come up with a pollinator patch plan. Um, and 
we put dates on it. So, for example, in a, a typical plan would, would include, well, where is the garden site going to be and how big is it going to be? And then how much sun does it get? Uh, how, how good is the soil in terms of um, sustaining water level? Like, is it going to drain very quickly and become dry? Or does it hold the water well because there's a lot of organic matter? Or is it like a swampy area where it doesn't drain for days? After we figured out uh, what our site looks like, then we'll select plants. Now, I have an excellent uh, spreadsheet for that. I say it's excellent because I've used it uh, to help the um, members of our group, and it works very well. All of that information <clears throat> that's on the um, website, the uh, Ranger Toolkit website, in terms of species for this area and which plants, um, attract which pollinators and what colors of blooms and how high they are. All of that information was available in PDF, but I've put it into a spreadsheet so that I can very easily, and you can too, I've made it available. You can filter on particular criteria and come up with your own selection that fits your, uh, your site. So after selecting plants, then it's a matter of ordering seeds or ordering the plants. If the seeds have to be stratified, you need to start that process, or you can collect, um, obtain seeds from me that are pre-stratified. And once that process has begun, the stratification or the, the seed orders or the plant orders, then it's time when the temperature is right to actually prep the ground. So either removing the turf, um, if, if soil needs to be amended, uh, there's a time to do that. Um, perhaps installing a perforated watering hose so you don't have to water by hand. You just turn the hose on and the, the water drips to uh, the places where the plants have been put in the ground. And putting watering bowls in. So just so you know the placement of you know, where the plants will go, where the watering bowl will be, and so on. And then the last step is to figure out the date for actual planting. Um, probably three to four weeks of watering is necessary so the plants get established. And after that, pull up a lawn chair and be prepared to go out there and sit and watch and listen. So the Bible for us, for pollinators, pollinating enthusiasts, is uh, this one here. It's called Selecting Plants for Pollinators, the Manitoulin Lake Simcoe Ecoregion. Now, on the David Suzuki, or rather on the Butterfly Way Ranger Toolkit uh, website, there is about 25 or 30 of these documents. And there's one for every ecoregion in Canada. In fact, there's probably more than 30. But ours is number 20 on the list. And our ecoregion is the Manitoulin Lake Simcoe region. And here's what looks like. So from the northwest uh, tip of Manitoulin, which is on the left, uh, all the way to south of Stratford, and then as far east as the other side of Kingston. So it's a fairly big ecoregion of uh, southern Ontario. And within its description are all of the habitats we would find in this ecoregion. So our habitat is in there as well, so close to the lake. And the, the pollinators that frequent this area, they are described uh, in that book along with the plants that are native to the area. So here's, an, here's a page from that book, or uh, from that, it's called Meet the Pollinators. It just describes uh, the different pollinators that we have in our area and gives some good information about those. Uh, oh, one thing I haven't mentioned too is we're not just looking at insects in terms of pollinators, um, but hummingbirds as well are excellent pollinators. And we're not just looking at uh, the insects we think of as pollinators, such as bees and butterflies. But uh, there are beetles, there are other flies, uh, wasps, moths. There's many different species that fall into this category of uh, pollinator. And then the, the part of the, um, this, the document, uh, the uh, Manitoulin Lake Simcoe ecoregion, is um, the part that's most helpful to us is the list of plants for our area. And as you can see on the screen, uh, all of the information is there for the botanical name, the common name, uh, the height that we can be expecting these plants to grow to. 
uh, the color, the flower season, how much sun they need, uh, what kind of soil moisture is ideal, what kind of pollinators they attract, and is it a host or not? And, and as I mentioned, we're not, we're not just talking about uh, flowering herbs, we're talking about trees and sedges and virtually anything that's a native plant in our area that is uh, beneficial to a pollinator is in this list. So now in the image uh, or on the screen, you see a, an image of my spreadsheet. So I took all of that information from uh, that document and I just put in a form, put it in a form that made it uh, simple for us to filter. And then on the, on the right hand side, I indicated uh, what the cost of the seeds were. And you can see that the, the seed cost is very low. I purchased all these in bulk. And so what I'm doing is distributing them at cost. Um, to people who are interested in putting pollinator patches in. And if you're not familiar with using a computer, that's fine. Uh, several members, uh, I've done this on the phone with them, they just call me and we talk about their uh, site where they would like to put the pollinator patch, uh, the kinds of things they're interested in doing. And then I work the spreadsheet for them and before long, like five or 10 minutes, we have a, a nice list tailored to the site where uh, the person is interested in creating the patch. So here's a sample plan. I call this one Rob and Jen's Back Garden Pollinator Patch Plan. We have a spot uh, in our backyard about uh, 10 by 12. It gets about six hours of sun a day, a little bit less in the spring and the fall and a little bit more in the middle of the summer. But it's heavy clay soil and it's poorly drained, so it's often a bit wet there. But that that's fine. I was able to find um, among the seeds I ordered using that spreadsheet plants that fit exactly that condition. So red elderberry, swamp milkweed, uh, white turtle head, some Joe pieweed, sneezeweed, some iris, uh, cardinal flowers, which are brilliant red, uh, eastern meadowsweet, um, some aster, and then some golden alexanders. Uh, the next part of the plan, I put in the dates, April, mid, mid April to mid uh, May is when the seeds need to be stratified. As of May 1st, uh, assuming we get warmer weather, uh, that's when I'll turn over the turf. And because it's so wet back there, I'll probably make mounds or ridges and maybe even put in a planter or two, uh, just in case of flooding. So at least part of the, the root base for the plant is, a, and I'll do a bit of shallow raking as well. So that might take me a week or two to prep that. And then as of the middle of May and through the, to the middle of June, that's when I'll sow and plant. And I've, I've indicated uh, on the slide here that I'm going to do the sowing and planting by height. And that means I'm gonna take into account that um, since the garden is, is south facing with the backing of trees behind it, I'm gonna put the tallest uh, pollinators closer to the trees and the shorter ones uh, on the south side, because if I wasn't careful about that, I may end up with uh, some of the shorter um, pollinating plants in the back. They would end up being shaded and not get enough light because the taller ones are growing up in front of them. So coming to the end here, I'd like to leave an idea for business owners. I mentioned this earlier, but uh, commercial setbacks are uh, a real opportunity to put in a pollinator patch. Uh, typically, um, we put lawns in uh, or grassy areas, maybe a few shrubs, and that takes time and money. And it's, it's not really being used. It's just to you know, keep the property from getting a, uh, a look that's unappealing. Well, the nice thing about pollinator patches is they're extremely appealing. They're just alive with color, uh, can be um, very creative, they can create a lot of uh, visual appeal. So I just wanted to throw that out there. If uh, any of you know business owners or if any business owners are listening, um, those setbacks are a really good spot to put a pollinator patch in. And then finally, if you know the idea of creating a pollinator patch is uh, a little too much for this year, I mean, we do have a global pandemic, it's hard to, to kind of organize anything in this time. Uh, consider a planter. Um, I, what I'd 
what I hope to be able to do in the next few weeks is get together some planter boxes. And these are shallow box trays about two feet square. They will be pre-sown, uh, so I'll, I'll put in a selection of seeds. And because it's untreated wood, uh, all they need to it, all they need is a place to put on the ground and then stay there, and they will slowly become part of the uh, environment. So it's just a box that comes ready with pollinated plants in it. Needs a bit of water. You don't need a lot of work in terms of preparation or even selection. Um, I'll put in a nice selection of uh, pollinators in there. So four or five or even one or two of these uh, could be a good way to start. Feeling overwhelmed? It's a lot of information I know, but don't feel overwhelmed. Um, I've got some contact information. Uh, you can reach me by the Facebook page. Uh, there is, like I said, a ton of very good information uh, on the Ranger Toolkit on Google Drive. Uh, you can reach me by email or phone. And I think that's about it, Nancy. I guess we're ready for questions. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. It was it's really, really, really informative. informative. And um, yeah, I really learned a lot. And I think that's uh, that our, our viewers did as well. Um, I did have a couple of questions. Um, so, and I'm not sure if you touched on this or not, but uh, you talked about uh, what to do to prepare for your pollinator garden. But uh, what about in the fall when we get to the fall and everything starts dying down and everything? Is there any sort of special things that we should be looking for or doing in our pollinator gardens uh, once we get to the end of the season? Uh, that's a really good question. And, you know, that's something I'm going to have to find out. Um, I've done a little bit uh, of reading about creating the pollen, well, a lot of reading about creating the pollinator patches. And I did notice in some of that, um, some of those documents, there was a mention of fall pruning. So some species uh, will do well if they're pruned, but not right down to the ground, so a mid height. Um, and I think that's to allow uh, the open stalks to be used by pollinators for pollinating insects for overwintering. So there's a number of strategies involved when it comes to fall maintenance. Uh, one of them is what can I do to maximize the benefit to pollinators? What can I do to make it look nice? Um, what can I do to make it um, ideal for the plants to continue growing in the spring? Uh, I'll, I'll find out more about that as the season goes on, but that's an excellent question. Okay, great. Yeah, we'll look forward to uh, maybe uh, uh, hitting up your Facebook page and uh, finding a little bit more about that. Um, so yeah, thank you for that. Uh, we do have a question from our YouTube chat. Uh, what annuals can we put in to fill up the uh, planting sites in the first year? That's uh, another good question. And there's um, just because we're focusing on native perennials, it doesn't exclude annuals. So if you have uh, annuals that you like um, for color or for size, or just because they're robust and easy to manage, by all means, mix those in. I don't know if there's any particular ones to avoid. Actually, there are ones to avoid. Um, there is a document on the uh, uh, Google Drive in the Ranger Toolkit that's called, I think the title is Plant Me Instead. Uh, and what it does is it lists a lot of common plants that have been introduced um, into our culture from other, other different ecoregions. And they're, they grow well here, like they're suited to our climate. But what they're not suited to is the pollinators because they simply have not evolved with access to those plants. So they really don't know what to do with them. And it may look you know, beautiful and colorful to us, but to a pollinator, it's, it's not food, it's not habitat, it's not a host plant. And so for them, it's not helpful at all. But there are some annuals that, um, that are helpful. Uh, and so I'll, I'll, what I'll do is just uh, put a link directly to that document on the Facebook page. But if you, anybody want to look it up themselves, it's called Plant Me Instead. And I'll just leave one example as part of the answer to that question. Uh, there's a great slide in one of the um, presentations on the web page. And it shows two properties in Toronto side by side. 
And on one side of the fence is a very nice looking ginkgo tree. And the ginkgo tree is an introduced species. It looks very nice. It supports um, less than five um, creatures in our ecosystem, insects, birds, squirrels, whatever they all, the number is less than five. And on the other side of the fence is an oak tree and an oak tree will support two to 300 different species. So it really is important to choose uh, annuals according to whether or not they're um, supportive of our pollinators. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, I think that was a great answer. And, and I think, again, like checking back to that, um, those documents that you'd put up in the Google Drive and checking back to the Facebook page, so you have a lot, a lot of information there. Um, I do have another question. Uh, what pollinator plants are best for shady areas? Do you have any recommendations, Rob? Um, well, if you don't mind, what I'll do is, um, can I just switch screens to the, uh, the spreadsheet and then I can show as a kind of demonstration how that works? Okay. Yeah, if you can just close off your PowerPoint and then, yeah, we should be able to see that there in just one second. Okay, let me. Okay, the PowerPoint's gone. Okay, maybe we can't do that. Oh, all right. Yeah, <laughs> that's okay. All right, well. Um, Technology. <laughs> And if, if, if it's OK to have uh, just a blank screen, I can answer that question anyway. So what was the condition again? Shady areas? Yeah, we were looking for things that you could plant in a shady area. OK, so what I'm doing, you can't see me doing it, but I'm just putting in the keyword on the spreadsheet shade. Uh -huh. And when I do that, um, I'm also going to put in the, the uh, filter to just choose host plants. So if it's for a shaded area, <clears throat> and also uh, typically if something is shaded, it's not too dry. So it's going to be either moist or well-drained. Mm -hmm. uh, could even be wet, but it's unlikely to be completely dry. Mm -hmm. so put that filter in too. And then I end up with, um, well, red owes your dogwood would be a, a good spot there. They can tolerate shade, uh, winterberry. In terms of flowering plants, um, red columbine will do okay. Mm -hmm. they, they like it moist and well drained. Uh, butterfly weed is okay in partial shade. Mm -hmm. uh, white turtle head is all right. Uh, there's quite a few wild geranium, uh, spotted joe pie weed. Uh, there's a woodland sunflower that would do well in partial shade, and that can be dry or well drained. Uh, lupins are okay, bee balm. And then there's a number of sedges, uh, Arctic brome or Indian grass will also do okay in shade. Cool. Yeah, no, that's great. That'll uh, definitely get, get them started there for sure. Um, okay. I have another question here, Rob. Uh, can you start the pollinators off in large planters and then transfer them at the end of the season to a garden? Um, that's another good question. I have heard from uh, several people that it can be a challenge to transplant uh, pollinators. But I think wh whoever asked that question is obviously on the right track because the best time to do it would be the fall. Mm -hmm. uh, so after the plant has has grown for a year in the planter and you it's died back, um, it shouldn't be too much of a shock to take the root ball that has developed and put that into the ground somewhere. Mm -hmm. But again, I can try and find information from the website and uh, maybe put that on the on the Facebook page uh, directly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess it could just be like a trial and error things too, right? Like some may transfer, some species may transfer better than others. Yeah, it can be. Um, one thing to point out about these pollinating plants is they really are like the perennials. They really have uh, evolved to to be robust in the, the uh, eco region that we live in. And some of them have roots that can go down more than six feet, mm -hmm. which is why they're, they're so tolerant of even the dry summer months, because the roots are able to extract moisture from, from down the ground. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, they they are very very hardy, and you know that's that's their job, right? So yeah, uh, yeah. yeah no, that's that's very good. Thank you for answering those questions. Um, now I apologize too if you uh, explained this earlier, I might have missed it, but you were talking about stratification and stratifying your seeds. Um, could you just um, let us know what you meant by that? Right. Um, so the seeds uh, are harvested. Um, I'm just going to walk away from the camera for one second and come okay. back to a little plate of seeds. Sure, okay. We haven't gone anywhere. Rob's coming right back. <laughs> <laughs> This is where we would put the elevator music in. <laughs> OK, so I have a, a small plate of uh, here in front of me mm -hmm. and I have a seed package. And when the seeds arrive um, in the mail, they're dry, which is what they need to be because they're they're you know, meant to be um, kept in a, a nice climate controlled environment over the winter. Or rather, as long as it takes until somebody wants them. And so they're, they can be anything from the size of these ones. I'm not sure if you can see them or not. These are about... Uh, Maybe if you could just hold them up in your hand a little bit. Yeah. T tell me if you see yeah, those. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Yeah, so it almost looks like a kind of pickling spice. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I was to throw these in the ground, uh, it's unlikely that anything would happen. Because from the seeds point of view, it's still the fall, right? They're still dry and they're still protected. Mm -hmm. What they need to experience is a certain period of time in a cold kind of wet or damp environment. So to stratify them, I would put them in a mix of sand. Like I have this bowl here. Mm -hmm. And then I would pour a bit of moisture on the bit of water on the sand. I don't want it to be dripping wet as if I mm -hmm. just scooped it from the lake bottom. But I do it together in a clump mm -hmm. and then I would put it in a, a little plastic bag. And then after that, I would put it in the fridge for 30 days or 60 days. And all of the seeds that I've ordered, um, they come with a germination code. And the germination code indicates uh, how long they need to be stratified for, uh, whether you can sow them directly on top of the ground or whether they need to be covered. Um, and some seeds, like this is quite remarkable. Some seeds, they not only have to be stratified, but after cold stratification, they have to go through a period of warm stratification and then followed by another cold stratification. <laughs> so for these, I mean, unless you're um, unless you've got a scientific lab set up, uh, some of these are best uh, planted uh, as nature intended. So for that particular type, which need the cold stratification, they would go into the ground in the fall. They would actually experience a winter, then they'll experience a summer of warm soil, and then another winter, and only after that second winter will they actually germinate. Wow, so you might think that you planted these, they didn't come up, but turns out. <laughs> yeah, and that's why it's important to know uh, what you're planting and what the, the germination code is and what the stratification requirements are. But as I said, um, I wasn't an expert in this, and I'm certainly not an expert now. <laughs> All of this information is, is available sometimes on the seed package and, and sometimes from the seed provider and sometimes on the website. Mm -hmm. Good. Excellent. Well, that's good. Thank you for explaining that. I wasn't uh, quite sure what that uh, what that meant. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right. Um, I think that is all our questions. I'm just going to do a little double check here. All right. Yeah, I think that's it for today. So thank you for answering those. I really, really appreciate it. Um, thanks for taking time and sharing your information with us today. Um, and again, for everybody watching, for more information, please feel free to contact Rob. Uh, he shared some information on his last slide there. Um, or you can check out the Butterfly Way Project uh, Facebook page, or you can check out the Butterfly Way Project website, um, especially if you plan on becoming a, uh, a a ranger in your own community. I uh, also just wanted to share too that, of course, being a library, we have many, many resources available for you about uh, gardening and pollinators. Um, so uh, just a couple of books I brought in today. We've got Attracting Native Pollinators, 
So this is protecting North America's bees and butterflies. Um, we have one called The Bee Friendly Garden, which is a beautiful looking book. It's gorgeous there. I love the cover on it. Um, but lots of books about gardening and planting uh, pollinator friendly gardens and pollinators themselves. So uh, make sure that you check out that at the library. And uh, if you don't have a library card, we've made it really easy to get one. You can either visit our website and click on the link for a temporary card, or you can call your local branch to arrange a curbside registration. Our membership is free and it allows access to thousands of books and videos, electronic resources like magazines and and learning tutorials and much, 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 much more. So again, we take a minute to um, we request to take a minute to fill in our evaluation for the program. Your feedback helps guide our program offerings and reinforce our value in the community. Uh, the link to the form is in the uh, description below. It just takes a second to do it. Remember again to subscribe to the Bruce County Public Library uh, channel on YouTube where you can find more live and recorded presentations, stories for children, activities you can do at home, lots of things on there. Uh, check our website events tab for upcoming. Uh, we have the Big Library Read Book Club next week, uh, Composting 101 program uh, next Thursday, and another YouTube live presentation with Master Gardeners Great Bruce, uh, the Gardening for Beginners program on the third. Uh, join us for the next Library Talks with on YouTube on Thursday, May 6th. May is Museum Month in Ontario, so we've invited the Bruce County Museum and Cultural Center to be our guest. And their doors may currently be closed to the public, but there's still many, many things happening behind the scenes, and we look to we look forward to finding out more. And last but not least, thank you again to our Digital Initiatives Coordinator, and with all the behind scenes uh, tech setup, our Communications Coordinator for setting up our YouTube channel and monitoring for comments, and promoting the event and of course we thank our special guest today frog shave and we thank you at home for tuning in so i want everybody to have a great day thank you and talk again <laughs>